welcome everybody here, all the new people, all, all the people who have been part of the congregation for a long time. And uh, let me do a quick prayer for all of us, whether we're here or not, and then uh, we can do our first hymn. Anyway, our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for, well, for all of your blessings, but uh, today we especially thank you for giving us a Sabbath day when we, uh, when we could just focus on uh, our fellowship with you and, and, and just resting from our, our, our daily toils. And we just like to ask you to be with us here today while we are here to worship you. And please send your Holy Spirit among us. Fill us with your love and uh, please be with all of us both here and uh, who are traveling and who are just couldn't make it today. And just let all of us uh, have a really great Sabbath experience with you, Lord. In your name, Jesus. Amen. We're starting with Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. Then to Isaiah 41, verse 10. Fear not, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Well, my sermon today. I, well, it almost ended up being me just reading an article that I had read. Just, it was that good. Um, it's about a subject we don't often talk about from the pulpit, I guess. About uh, The article is about suicide. And... Uh, But it was good. It was it was uh, very uplifting, and uh, like I said, I almost just said, "Well, here's the guys, uh, Jonathan Noyes and Greg Kokel wrote it, and I'm going to read it." But uh, I realized I had some other things to say about it. Um, not because it was. I want to just not talk about just suicide per se, but you know, the literal taking your own life, but different different forms of what I, I think of as suicide that seem to be committing in life lately more and more, uh, especially since the great lockdown and COVID and all that, and people, uh, there have been more and more deaths of despair, you know, whether suicide or, you know, drug poisoning or whatever, alcoholism, even murder. But uh, also just uh, people doing things, turning to uh, drugs or any other behavior that uh, kind of diminishes their life. Anyway, um, I wanted to read the uh, a little more of. Deuteronomy 30. There's just a little more to it. Oops. Come on. Our cell phones are both a super blessing and a, kind of a curse. I have to look things up and I'm not good at it yet. And I often have wondered, you know, I use my little screen so much during my sermons I would what if it just went out later you guys would be hearing a very extemporaneous sermon so anyway let's start at Deuteronomy 30 starting at verse 15 I just wanted to read the rest of this because I kind of think it sets things up for us fee I have set before you today life and prosperity and death and adversity in that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments. 
that you may live and multiply and that the Lord your God may bless you in the land where you are entering and to possess, possess it. Uh, not here. <laughs> That's all right. Anyway, but if your heart turns away and you will not obey, but are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land where you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess it. This is what God is telling the Israelites right before they're getting ready to enter the promised land. And I kind of see that as sort of metaphorical for what we experience when we get saved and come into, you know, our promised land, our rest in Christ. Anyway, then it goes to verse 19. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God by obeying his voice, by holding fast to him. For this is your life and the length of your days, that you may live in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. And he also swore to us, you know, what we would receive when we got saved and gave our life to Christ. And by the way, we do worship the same God that the uh, Hebrews worshipped, Abraham the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's one test for if anyone says, well, from another faith like Mormonism or, or Islam says, well, we worship the same God as you. They really, do you worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Well, not everyone does. They, they, like Muslims worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and I believe it's Ishmael. But uh, anyway, while I was uh, thinking about this sermon and sort of preparing for it, I was going online, looking around at different things. And I don't remember how I found it, but it was on YouTube. And Greg Laurie was interviewing someone. Someone quoted this verse, 19. I call heaven and earth to witness to you today. I have set before you life and death. But choose life. You never guess who is saying that. That's saying that's that's uh, his story of his life. It's how, you know how he came to Christ. You know who Greg Laurie was interviewing? Alice Cooper. I was like, and uh, I didn't know it until well, I I'd, I'd heard that Alice Cooper was religious before, but. Turns out, you know, he, he was raised Christian. He, he went to work to church like two or three times a week. And uh, he, he kind of fell away from it at the height of his fame when he turned to drugs and alcohol and all that. But he eventually uh, reached a point where he had to make a choice. and He chose life. But anyway, so it, you got to wonder, you know, why does anyone not choose life, whether they're believers or not? Well, it boils down to loss of hope. Life is hard sometimes. In fact, most of the time. In fact, uh, my, my favorite Christian apologist, Greg Kokel, he says, one of the things he would say once in a while is, here's kind of the uh, Christian outlook on life. Life is hard, then you die. But I mean, he says that's not all there is to it. There's a lot of joy in there too. And you're doing something, you're accomplishing something if, if you're saved anyway, or on your way to being saved. But yeah, life is hard most of the time. You, you, you know, you can lose hope through, you know, disappointments. You know, people, you know, suffer sexual violations, substance abuse, depression, shame, guilt. Loneliness, emotional or physical pain. 
And you know what? So there's uh, one particular set of people, which is most people, I think, that are particularly uh, susceptible to life's hardships. That's non-Christians. We have, you know, we can be susceptible to, but non-Christians, you know, especially if you're atheist non-Christians, you, you're, 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 your worldview is naturalism, materialism. There is no spiritual. There is no life after. There's nothing. Basically, you know, for atheism and naturalism, materialism leads to nihilism, which literally means nothingism. Now, that means, you know, like all the difficulties, all the hardships, and all the joys and all the wonderful things we experience in life ultimately don't mean anything if you don't believe in God. Life has no meaning ultimately. Like uh, one challenge that I've heard atheists make before is, you know, they'll, they'll go to a Christian and say, look, you know, you know, they're basically alluding to the problem of evil. You know, if there's a good, all good and all loving and all powerful God, why is there evil in the world? And they'll say, challenge a Christian by saying, what would you tell a, like a four, three or four year old child that's dying of cancer and in and, and suffering pain? And, and, and what would you say to him, you know, well, you know, you know, life is really hard and, and, you know, but you'll be in a better place. You know, there, you know, there's an all loving, all powerful God and he's just letting you suffer, but it'll be all right in the end. And of course, the classic comeback to that, to the atheist, the Christian to say, well, what would you tell that child? Hey, you, all you could say is life is tough, then you die. Tough luck, kid. You know, all your suffering, all the happiness, everything you've experienced didn't mean anything. Oh, well. So you can see why an atheist would be susceptible, susceptible to despair. I, I'm surprised I survived my time of you know, life and atheism. I just, I don't know why, but it, I mean, I got to the point of despair where, where I was like praying to God. I was an atheist, but I was praying to God. It was one of those prayers like, God, if you exist, I would make awful, awful prayers. Literally, I guess, God awful prayer is like, I pray, God, just turn me into a zombie so I don't have to experience all this. You know, I don't like it. But for somehow, I guess it was just this Holy Spirit working my life before I even knew it. Suicide was never in the cards for me. So, I don't know why. Because I didn't have what we as Christians have. Now, we believers in God, we, we can experience despair. We can experience trials and tribulations. There's a whole, there's six times in the Bible someone took his own life. I could read them to you, but that's not important. But uh, what is important is that others persevered. And uh, here I will kind of I'll read some excerpts from that article I alluded to. By the way, if you go to str.org right now, um, I believe that article is on the front page. It's called, uh, I'll scroll back to the top now, Suicide When Hope Runs Out. And you can read the real thing. You want to have to just listen to me tell you about it. But anyway, uh, there is six times, like I said in the Bible, that uh, someone took their own life, but then others, we are told, persevered. 
Solomon, uh, what is his famous saying, if I can scroll to it? Uh, Ecclesiastes 1-2. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. He was just looking at everything under the sun. And he seemed to you know, conclude, well, on that basis, life was ultimately futile, meaningless. But, and you can go to, eventually he gets to Ecclesiastes 12.13. Conclusion, when all has been heard is, fear God and keep his commandments. And I've pulled, I'm not, you know, a biblical scholar or anything, and I don't definitely don't know biblical Greek, but I'm told that a lot of times when um, the word fear, as in fear God, is used, it doesn't mean quite exactly the same thing as it does to us where we are terrified. It could just mean like overwhelming awe. Like first time you see the Grand Canyon, you're like, wow. Or for me, it was like uh, uh, when I was growing up, I was the oldest of four kids. And uh, I remember, particularly with my youngest sibling, my baby sister, when she was a baby, holding her. And, and uh, just feeling, you know, just so much love and affection for her that, it, I mean, physically it felt like fear. You felt the same thing before holding a niece or nephew. Yeah, I can't even imagine what it would you know, I've never had kids myself. You who have, or when you're holding your own child, your flesh and blood, that must, you know, feel like I would really, really feel scared, I mean, even though I'd be so happy. But anyway, Solomon works through all of the uh trials and tribulations, and he concludes, you know, in this world, we don't want to put our hope in this world. We put our hope in God. And then uh, Elijah, he was just about at the point of uh, giving up. He begged for God to take his life, but I didn't. So, and, you know, God came through for him and revived him. Paul, that one's a big one for me. Just, uh, I don't know, just uh, what Paul went through. He was first, when he was of this world, I guess, he didn't think he was. Thought he was, you know, he was a Pharisee. He thought he was had, you know, had his finger on, you know, the reality of it. But and the man, he was full of hate. He was vicious. I mean, the Christians lived in dread of him. Then showing up in their house and taking them and their whole family off to prison, maybe to execute. And he was just voraciously after Christians. But then, then. When he got saved, and he started learning about this Christ that he had been persecuting. And he became one of Christ's followers. What happened? Well, then he started suffering the persecution. I mean, think about it. He was like, how many times was he beaten? How many times was he imprisoned? He went through shipwrecks. And then, you know, ultimately it led to prison and execution. But, you know, what was his attitude that, towards that? Well, in Second Corinthians 1, reading at verse 9, we had this sentence of death within ourselves, so that we could not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a peril of death. And will deliver us. He on whom we have set our hope. That's how he got through it all. He put his hope in Christ. Christ who had died for us. So that 
all of our suffering and all of our joy. And it would all mean something someday because we would be with him for eternity. And ultimately, uh, you go to, uh, well, the point is, God will decide when he is done with us in this world. And until then, no matter what hardships we experience, he will sustain us if we put our trust in him. And that is how we get through life's hardships without sinking into despair. But anyway, trials and tribulations are not the only things that can trip up a Christian in this life. You know what else will? Legalism. The notion that we have to justify ourselves, that we have to live by the law or we are doomed. But God's law is perfect. And if you look in, like, I think, 2 Corinthians 3, verses 4 through 6. Let's see if I... Well, I wrote it down here. Part that I wanted to quote. Oh, yeah. Not the letter of the law, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. You see that the letter of the law kills. The law, those Ten Commandments, is a judgment on us because we can't, we can't live perfectly. So we have to depend on Christ. He says here, God's law, God's perfect law destroys any, any help of, any hope of self justification. We can't justify our own lives. Only Christ can. Only God's grace. Now look at Psalm 130, starting at verse 1. Out of the depths, out of the depths of despair, I have cried to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O oh Lord, who could stand? Well, no one could stand. But there is forgiveness within you, that you may be feared. Now, I think there is fear also. It does at least mean afraid. Because, you know, if God can forgive us, what happens if he doesn't? But it also does mean the other sense of fear. It's just like, oh, it's so wonderful, so awesome, so great. Look at Psalm 138 through 12. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He has not dealt with us according to our sins nor rewarded us according to our iniquities, which is good for us. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from him, from us, rather. You want to know where we stand with God in terms of legalism, in terms of our violation of the law? Romans 8, 1 through, th 1 through 3. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, God did. He sent his own son to do that. So, let's do what the... We're told to do in Hebrews 10, verse 22. Let us draw near with sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience 
That's what gets to us a lot of times, our conscience. Thank God, because that means we have a conscience. Have you ever met anyone who doesn't or doesn't seem to? Really, really scary. Anyway, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, wavering for he who promised is faithful. All right, so this is the part where I come to other forms of suicide that I was referring to earlier. And the one that I see right going on right now, another topic that we don't usually address from the pulpit, but I think that we need to. And it's, in my, in my humble opinion, the worst sort of suicide. I mean, you don't really kill yourself, but you destroy who you are. And it's like right now, the whole world is telling us that we should all hate who we are. We should hate ourselves based, you know, it's, it's, it runs kind of a continuum from, you know, who's the most hate worthy to who's the least, but we're all, according to this idea, all hate worthy, all of us. We all should hate who we are, either on the basis of our sex, the basis of our so called race, like one of those people that just believes that race is a social construct. It's not a actual thing that I mean that doesn't mean it doesn't exist or that doesn't matter. It just means that it's it's a self delusion. It's just it's something that you know well, why in the world would we judge one another or ourselves on the basis of our skin tone? I mean what sets us apart from animals that we eat sometimes, some of us. I'm one of them. I didn't used to be, but I am. It's not what we look like physically. It's what we look like spiritually. We are all image bearers of God. Basically what I'm talking about is transgenderism. And I just, it infuriates me that it's targeted towards children the most. And they, they'll tell them, you know, that they, they, they're not the right person that they're supposed to be. They're not the right being. They're not the right sex. They're not the right whatever. And they can't change anything from, you know, they can't. They can't change their, their their race. Can't change, you know, whether they're wealthier. Well, they could, but but so they change what they can, and and they people try to tell them, you were born in the wrong body. Don't ever let anyone tell you that. Don't ever let anyone tell your kids that. God, that's just like, God did not make mistakes. God doesn't make mistakes. He's not capable of making mistakes. He made all of us the way he wanted us to be. And yet, they'll go and tell people of all ages, really, that they need to modify themselves. They need to mutilate themselves. They need to take drugs that will sterilize them for life. They say it's just to hold off puberty or whatever, or change your hormonal balance so you feel like a different sex. But it does sterilize you. Then they want you to mutilate yourself. And to me, that's just the worst. Because... You're, you're, you're spitting in God's eye and your own. 
So I just hope that no one lets anyone tell them that. I want you to look at a Psalm 139, verse 14. In fact, let's read 11 through 16. Let's see. So it starts out, you know, like someone who's might be turning towards despair. It says, if I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. He's talking to God now. And the night is as bright as day. Darkness and light are alike to you, to God. For you, God, formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. God did that. From the moment you were conceived, you were the being you're supposed to be, you're supposed to grow up to be. And in vor verse 14, I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. There's that fearful. It's just so awesome and wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well deep inside. We all know we are exactly as God made us to be. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in, in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance. Unformed substance. A spirit. Our soul, us, we are spirits. It's part of our nature that we have bodies, but it's not the essential part of our nature because after we our body dies, we continue to live. Someday we will all have bodies again. And I think, I believe it's for believers and unbelievers alike, the difference will be that believers, those who are saved, will be given a body that's indestructible. I mean, it, I mean it, at least it won't deteriorate. It won't get sick. You won't get tired. All the trials and tribulations of this world will be over. And then for the rest of eternity, we will experience nothing but the joy of being in direct fellowship with the only perfectly and infinitely loving being there is, God himself. Anyway, your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me. God decided how many days we should have, and we should not defy his will for us. Anyway, so if you start feeling d d despair, or know someone who is, according to this article, and I, I agree, there's three things you should do. Remember who you are, who you really are. You are an image bearer of God. Let's go to Romans 5. Starting at verse 6. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Yeah, we, we're morally imperfect. We're ungodly. But Christ died for us. That's how much God loves us. That's the esteem that he holds us in. We are his highest creation. We'll go to First Peter. Oops. Chapter one, verse eighteen. I get it right. First Peter one eighteen. 
knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ, Christ loved us so much the way we are, as flawed as we are in this world. He was willing to die for us. So that's the first thing. We need to remember who we are and who loves us. Second thing, don't believe lies. People will try to fill you with lies. I'm just talking about some of them. But don't believe them. Through a John eight forty four. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is, there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. For he is a liar and the father of lies. That's who I think is manipulating. It's always been that. From the beginning of time, God's enemy that is manipulating us with lies and trying to get us to destroy what God has made for us. To destroy ourselves. To destroy our lives. Anyway, third thing you should do, realize you are not alone. You are not alone in this. We have each other. Most of us have close family members. All, and like I said, all of us have each other. But even those who think they're alone, we have God. If we have given ourselves to Christ, we are not alone. We can struggle knowing that we have hope. And hope in the biblical sense is not just wishful thinking. Hope in the biblical sense is a warranted expectation. You have good reasons to believe that you will be redeemed. Anyway, the last paragraph of the article I read that I based this sermon on is if you are a loved one, Struggle with suicidal thoughts. Remember, you are not alone. You are loved by God. As you press on through your struggles, God will be there for you. And I just wanted to uh, finish by reading once again the uh, second scripture reading that we had today. Isaiah 41.10 Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That is God's promise to us. And we can take him up on that promise. He does not make promises. He does not keep. So whatever you do, you yourselves persevere, confident in who you are before God. Encourage everyone you know to persevere, no matter what. Don't ever. You're going to experience 
hardship and despair. Don't ever give in to it. You don't have any reason to. Anyway. Oh. Do the closing hymn. And then I'll do our closing prayer. So. At this point, Jessica, one of our members, gave a great message to everyone, especially you watching from home. Unfortunately, we were unable to record the sound. So here's a summary of what she said. If you were suffering from suicidal thoughts, please talk to someone right away. There are so many resources out there and you are not alone. One resource that I found is the Christians in Crisis Hotline. You can locate them online at www.christiansincrisis.com. That's Christians, the letter N, crisis.com, or you can call them at 1-844-472-9687. You can also do a quick Google search to find whatever best fits your needs. Whatever you do, please get help right away. Thank you for adding that. You did. And I'm just glad you did because it reminded me to mention something in the article I can't, can't believe I didn't mention uh she's right suicide is really very <laughs> any form of it actually as far as I, i'm concerned literal or or just you know figurative it's very serious and uh she mentioned what you should do if 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 you're feeling desperate thoughts the article also mentioned what you should do if others are Someone you know, a friend, a family member. First of, first of all, let them know how dearly they are loved and how important they are to you and everyone else. And here's what you should not do. Don't, no matter how much they want you to or how much you want to be a good friend who, who, who can uh, keep a confidence, don't promise them that you won't tell anyone. You make sure you tell someone. And uh, once again, I'd, I'd, I'd encourage you to go to this article, str.org, and uh, it is, it's, it's just a really, it's worth reading. And I'm sorry if, you know, I, I bummed people out and, you know, you know, we've all had, you know, known someone or known someone who's known someone who's had to deal with this. So it can be really touchy. This is one of those topics that, you know, I, I can understand why people don't ever want to stand at the pulpit and talk about them. But uh, I hope I, I haven't just dredged up any old experiences or feelings that you don't want. I hope I have also given you some hope you can share with others and hold in your own heart. Anyway, let's close in prayer. Our Lord in heaven, we thank you so much for all of you have given us. Thank you for the life you have given us. Thank you for creating us, for, for to, to, to have fellowship with you, Lord, in this world and the next. We just ask you to be with us all of our brothers and sisters and everyone we love and to encourage us in our, our walk in this world and then to face the struggles we have to and just to always keep in mind that you are with us always and it will turn out superbly, awesomely, wonderfully in the end. We thank you for that, Lord. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Fellowship lunch, and it's right here. Next Sabbath, there won't be church. Okay. Oh, by the way, next Sabbath, uh, most of us will be gone, so there won't be church. The Sabbath after that, everybody come.